<laughs> you like that, Michael? That was great. Thank you, Michael. Guys, listeners of the podcast, um, I want to remind you guys that our show is on iTunes podcast as well. And when the show ends at the, you know, the hour mark here on Adobe Radio, the party goes on. It it doesn't just stop. And you can listen to the rest of it on iTunes um, Thursday at midnight. Yeah. So by Friday morning, you should have it. Yeah. Friday morning, you should have the whole episode. Yeah. Ish. And then you can also watch it on YouTube. So check us out there. Our guest today is director, producer, editor, actor, musician, and novel writer. I mean, pretty... Pretty impressive, if I if I do say so myself. His name is Dave Patton, and I had the pleasure of working with him on this short film called Little Fig, and he co-directed with Britt Robertson. Amazing, amazing project. One of my most favorite projects I've ever gotten to work on. Let's give it up for the great Dave Patton. All right. Michael, it worked. <laughs> Yes, we're back in the studio. It's been a while, Dave. This is like I've been, almost two weeks now since I've been in here. Yeah, taking some time off. Yeah, shooting short films extraordinaire mm -hmm. with you. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so director, actor, producer, editor, musician. Yeah. Any, anything else? <laughs> anything else should we add to the list? Uh, I actually have a, a novel that's been published. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what kind of novel? Uh, it's kind of like a coming of age type story about this. Uh, dang, I don't have my elevator pitch. No, that's fine. ready for it right now. But uh, it's like this 26 year old famous musician who's um, after one of his shows gets uh, caught up with like an old friend from the past who yeah. kind of forces him to come to terms with a lot of the, you know, kind of darker stuff he did on his way on his way up, you know how... Oh, shit. Sometimes that can happen and kind of come to terms with his demons and everything. Yeah. Um, through, you know, and then we get to, like, relive kind of what he went through when he was younger. Uh, and then it catches up to present day. Dude. So. The people, like, having to do sketchy things to get into this business, like the entertainment business, that is not a stereotype. No. First of all, I was just meeting with someone in Tulsa, and mm -hmm. they'll remain nameless, but... She was telling me about some sketchy things whenever she first came out here. You know, she was just coming out for a little bit to check it out. And I was like, please be careful. Yeah, Do women you... have it. Have, yeah, yeah have she was a woman. Especially, especially terrible, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, and then I saw an E-bombs world. Super inappropriate. By the way, I've been visiting E-bombs world. E-bombs world is still a website. <laughs> Dude. It's still up. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Since high school. Like when it was no, first I know, a thing. I know. Like back in the day, I was just surprised it's still around. Yeah, yeah I, visit, I visited like – I'm going to say almost daily yeah. because there's at least some videos on there that I feel like, okay, these are the viral or the things that I, I want to see. What's the, what's, what does it focus on now? Like versus live leak, you know, how live leaks like real, oh, real yeah. dark, oh, yeah. like dark corner of the yes. internet. You don't really want to go to too often. <laughs> so E-bombs is like still comedy based type. Thing? Uh, it's all over the place. Yeah. There's like a comedy section. There's like, not like naked women, but like a, you know, like sexy women and anime clothes section. Hey. And then they have like okay. the like the car crashes set, you know, like the more violent things, but nothing that you're going to be like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. And they have the weird videos or like the interesting videos. But this one was like total sketch thing that happened in the 70s or 60s where NBC pulled it before he can get to the West Coast. It was a game show. Was it the pop school? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You saw that. I've seen it, yeah. <laughs> hey, man. What? No red flags while yeah. filming it. They were 17. <laughs> so people listening, it was basically, do you know what I'm talking about, Michael? I don't think so. Okay. So it's two two chicks, 17 years old. I don't know, on some game show or Yeah. They were just trying to It was a talent wasn't it a talent show or something and it was like how well they can lick lollipops. Yeah, like popsicles, yeah. And you're watching very you're suggestive. like oh. very suggestive. Yeah. And then one of the game show like guest judges was like I had to do that to get into this business, or that's how I got my start in this business. Ah. And the crowd's like, yeah! <laughs> and you're watching it now like, ah, oh, this God. is so uncomfortable. Yeah. But yeah, it's super sketch. And um, 
what was it on H three H three podcast or the YouTube channel H three H three? Yeah, I know what you're talking. About. Yeah. yeah. So they have a podcast, and one of the things they or no, this has nothing to do with podcast, but they reviewed one of those videos where it's like, I'm gonna kiss random girls on the street, mm-hmm. and one of them was like girls in the hijab, like mm-hmm. like they were trying to pretend they were Muslim girls, and obviously these are paid women. Yeah. But they advertise it as. Like, oh, no, these are just random girls we pick up. And this poor girl, the breakdown on the acting website was a comedy, established comedy series. And then it went from, like, in the audition, oh, it's a comedy web series. Okay. And then as soon as he met her, he was like, hi, I'm a famous YouTuber. Like, it just... So fills me with right <laughs> yeah. like hey man and then he basically tricked her into doing all this and there were some red flags along the way whenever he would say hey make sure you wear a thong to the thing yeah and she just like she just didn't like a lot of girls i feel like are in this position where they feel like just so like oh, oh okay like they freeze up you know what i mean i yeah. don't know plus i mean it's a, it's an opportunity or at least presents itself as one and you know everybody's out here trying to make stuff happen right and yeah they, they just totally take advantage of of people in situations like that which is such a bummer and those prank channels are so bad man they're just so oh god so cringe i, I don't know it's got to be like 10 year old boys that are watching it you know like just like little middle school kids that think it's hilarious because i can't imagine anyone else does how is that sustainable do you think like for like guys like logan paul or jake paul i honestly think it's like the middle school crowd and they all get their you know when he puts out merchandise and stuff they Mm. all get their mom's credit card and and buy it and everything that's that's what it has to be because as soon as you you know become any type of a you know an adult in terms of like your thinking and stuff which i would say you know once you get into high school things start getting a little more real and it's like yeah you can't possibly find that stuff funny i don't know dude some of those like uh i'll I'll send you it i'm not gonna say who it is because i've actually had him on my past podcast before before he got like really big and he seemed like a you know like a nice guy or whatever but some, sometimes they post things that I'm like, there's literally no comedy in this. There's yeah. no punchline. There's no setup. Yeah. What is the comedy? You've just added like the sound effects on iTunes Garage. What I uh, the gar- what is it called? Garage Band. Garage Band. Yeah. 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 I don't know, man. I know. Have you ever had to encounter stuff like that, like sketchy things, when you started out? Because you do a lot of directing. Yeah. Um, no, not really with directing, because you're more. You're more the one, you know, that's mm. doing the hiring and stuff like that. Yeah. The, you know, directing, producing. Um, so in that case, you just want to make sure you're not doing this <laughs> stuff, you know. Um, so, you know, and when you got no but when you're starting out and you got no budget and you're asking yeah. favors and stuff, you know, there. Um, I hope that I haven't come across as in, in that way. Um, well, on the short film we just shot, I have to. You got I have to. I have filed some complaints. Oh, yeah. You'll be hearing from SAG after. Okay. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah no uh when i was p- pursuing acting more um which was right after i did that delivery man movie yeah and i moved out here um that i think the acting you just because you're at the i don't know like you just have to please people in order to even get your job anyway and so you just are constantly put in those type of positions where you're just there to you know befriend Mm. some producer or casting agent or what you know whatever it, it may be um and yeah that's it it definitely feels like you know you're you're hoeing yourself out a little bit in that type of a situation right. um which I wasn't a huge fan of um and I didn't you know I wasn't like booking anything anyway so it and I just like to get stuff done and have been doing stuff on my own kind of independently from the beginning and so uh, I've kind of shied away from like the pursuit of the acting stuff and going more with producing and, and directing, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, if there ever was times, it was it was like it seems in my memory to be clear, like a hundred percent from like acting type stuff, yeah. which is curious. I'm curious. I don't know. I mean, you're in that circuit right now, so I starting out there was definitely stuff I auditioned for. I actually walked off a set. Now that you're. Now that we're talking about it, yeah, that was the one set I walked off of, Mm. and it was for a featured extra role. Mm. And then I got there, and there were a few red flags. First of all, nobody was there. 
when I when <laughs> my call time was announced to be there. Oh, geez. And then some of the other extras were starting to show up as well. And we're like, where is this place? Do we have the right address? And mm. I'm like, and by the way, I'm super green to yeah, yeah. L.A. And I'm like, I don't know. And then one of the producers comes and she's like, hey, can you help me with these things? I'm like, oh, sure. I'm like this nice Oklahoma boy. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize like that's no, you're not supposed to do any of that stuff. And we're helping bring in boxes for the production. And then everybody starts showing up. We're like, cool. And then we start realizing, oh, <clears throat> we're, we're prisoners. OK, cool. Oh, we're prisoners in a dungeon. OK, cool. And oh, then, for the scene? In the for the, <laughs> yes. And then we realize, oh, this is like a weird, like some of us are sex slaves. Some of us have been put to fight each other. Oh, dang. And the, the director was being like, I want to say not physically manhandled, but like their star actor, I guess he was in some like, he was famous back whenever. Mm -hmm. So he started coming in and redirecting the whole scene. And I'm like, oh, this is, is this, I don't think this is how it's supposed to work, yeah. you know? <laughs> And then he w he picked me and this other dude to like shadow box each other in the corner. Oh, nice. And I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, like, what do we want us to do? And he's like, just shadow box each other. And it was like so awkward and uncomfortable. <laughs> and then like these girls were supposed to be like almost topless or whatever, you know, in yeah. their bikinis. And then finally, after they established everything and they were like setting up the shot, dude, I just, I was like, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to walk away. Yeah. I told one of the extras, I'm, like, I'm, I'm just going to go. Yeah. And I like walked off the set. Yeah. There I you don't go. know, man. Yeah. yeah I haven't, I haven't uh, seen too much of that. Fortunately, my, the, the creepy stuff always seems like it's, um, it's, you know, at like the, you know, the parties or after parties and mixers and stuff like that. Um, ah, seems okay. to be where, you know, things get, the lines get blurred, you know? And yeah, I don't go to a lot of those. That's good. I mean, the most I think is like for network stuff where it's like the cast crew party. You know? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. That stuff. But like if there's an after party, I'm like, I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm waking up early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so where – I want to talk about the short film sure. that we just shot. Mm -hmm. And I know I told you before, but this was like the second best project I've ever gotten to work on. It's awesome. Life. It's really I awesome had such a blast shooting it. Heavy subject matter, mm -hmm. but – the whole experience was great. I love the story we're telling. I can't wait for people to see this. And you guys are trucking along. Oh, yeah. And yeah. editing it away. Where did the initial idea to – I mean, I, I know you co-directed with Britt, right? Mm -hmm. And where did – how did you guys develop this idea for this story? Where did it come from? <laughs> it's inspired by you. Britt um... – approached me we went out to dinner or whatever and uh she was like yeah I'm, you know i'm working on this new show and uh there's this dude we sam who's just like the most interesting dude i've met in a long oh, time oh you're being serious no i'm not kidding yeah yeah okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was like okay oh the, 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 this is no, yeah, okay yeah. i thought it was okay i knew like okay cool she knows like i'm from syria and stuff like that so but i didn't know okay to the yeah, full there's extent. the response okay. i was looking for all yeah. right yeah okay all right well now I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're learning something new. All right, great. Yeah, yeah, and she and yeah, she kind of to sum it up was like, yeah, he's you know I know he's from Syria and stuff, and uh, has you know wants to is talking about being able to help out his family and everything, mm -hmm. and get him a house and stuff like that. Or, yeah, you know, and uh, it's just really really a cool thing, and so, you know, he's just a curious dude, and I, I kind of love the idea of um, you know this this character who's just who just hustles endlessly and just has a positive attitude about things and is willing to continue working you know just against all odds type thing mm. and um to try to make something happen and she wanted to interweave this backstory that you know related to Syria and then so then we were you know uh we just we're grinding out just developing the story it took you know it was a it was a bunch of weeks probably 2 months to get um to get everything together, which I know on the grand scheme of things is, is kind of a short time, but, um, she was coming downtown. She would come downtown. We went to this food hall that's like next door to my apartment building. And, uh, we would just be there for, you know, four or five hours every day, just tearing apart whatever we came up with the day before <laughs> and, uh, and trying to re restructure and reorganize everything. And, um, and then, yeah, finally got it to, a place where we felt like all the character motivations were there and, you know, it was 
the story that we wanted to tell that we could tell with you know within budgetary restriction means and all that stuff absolutely um and then yeah and then i took kind of what we had outlined and and wrote the draft and everything and um which was like you know this was like the probably 15th draft or whatever that yeah. we had uh, and Britt had read it on the plane she said and uh and hit me up on text message she like went and bought internet on the plane just so she could like text me <laughs> she's like i'm like crying on the plane it's so good i love it that's awesome so that's when we knew we finally had you know a draft that we were gonna push forward with and then um yeah and then pre-production started and that and is so that, two and a half months it just if if you're in creative and listening to this like there's no excuse to like have something drag on for like yeah years oh, yeah. on a project usually like for i think for 99 percent projects you can't yeah no I'm, i mean my style is always just pulling the trigger as soon as it kind of feels relatively ready um i'm by no means a perfectionist which i feel i'm like i'm happy that i'm not because mm -hmm. i've met a lot of people that are perfectionists and it's it's a very like i just feel like it it, it plagues their minds and it won't like nothing is ever good enough to release or nothing's ever good enough. And so therefore they never get anything done because it's just from inception is never going to be good enough to the point where they would actually go forward and, and get mm. something done. And that's, you know, uh, yeah, I just feel like, especially being in LA for, I'm going on, I guess six years and meeting a lot of people out here who are, are trying you know, chasing the dream and everything and don't, you know, months weeks turn into months and months turn into years real quick and Very. people don't have anything to show for it and i that has happened to me you know in my like when i was like 26 27 that was probably like the worst years of my life this is like the darkest times yeah and i feel like everybody's dark night comes for them at one point in their in their life and that was mine uh and just sitting around waiting for people to call you back and all that stuff and just yeah all of a sudden a year went by and i had gotten nothing done and i that feeling i hated that feeling so much more than any of the other let down feelings that i have ever experienced and so i've just you know i've always kind of committed to just gotta get something you gotta get something done you gotta have projects going gotta have a lot of irons in the fire may i ask what was when you say darkest times was it because there was no work personal stuff yeah everything had, yeah everything fell apart um mm. with work wise i i moved out off of so i had like started in music videos and everything in philly and came up with this rapper named meek mill who's pretty famous now yeah. and everything and like this was in the beginning and we really like got the ball rolling and it was you know very much an upward trajectory of success right uh straight out of college and then i booked the deliver man movie which was awesome and like made a little bit of money where i could actually move out here and and then i had and i was rep by caa and then I had like management 360 was managing me and everything. Wow. So I had like the Titans on my side and they gave me like three months to go book something. You know, I jumped in like midway through pilot season and I didn't book anything and like, and everything disappeared. And then simultaneously I was chasing music career and everything. Had a, had a solid manager who really hooked me up with a lot of stuff. And we had like a, a record deal on the table that then fell through. Jeez. And then... I've had three record record deals that have fallen through in like the last 10 years that I've been doing music. Um, sucks just as bad every time that it happens. You never get used to it. And um, yeah, and so it was the culmination of all this stuff falling apart and wow. just being in a new city, for, you know, from Philly. Like I, I had so many connections that I totally took for granted. I realized once I moved out here, like knowing no one, in terms of like getting film stuff done and everything, mm -hmm. In Philly, I can, first off, everyone is, like, down to let you film in places. Here, it's, like, if you need a bar or something, like, I, you know, in Philly, I'm, like, hey, can I shoot in your bar? I got a music video or whatever. I'll put your sign in there and shout you out and everything. You'll get some exposure. They're, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me know when you want to do it. We'll shut it down. We'll make it happen for you. And I'm, like, hell, yeah, cool. And I, like, got used to that. And then you come out here and ask the same thing. They're, like, sure, yeah, we'll shut it down for you. It's, like, five grand. Plus, like, <laughs> you got to have $5 million worth of insurance and everything and all this stuff all the permits and all that. And so this town is just very unfriendly to indie filmmaking um, across the board, pretty much. Uh, everybody's just used to the big money out here. Um, and so I couldn't even get my own projects done. And yeah, it was just, it was just very, um, just sucked, man. It was just like, 
it just sucks to have to feel like everything is going right and then to just have it all yanked um from underneath you and that's, yeah teach that, you a lot about yourself i think that's life too especially like with some personal stuff that's been happening to me with like you know some some accidents with my family my dad and stuff like that the people mm-hmm. have been listening like it can turn for the worse so quickly yeah everything can change in a second yeah and on the flip side of it it can change for the better in a second mm-hmm. like one day it'll just all, yeah. of a sudden, all this money's in your bank account that wasn't there before. You <laughs> yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things I've learned with that is this great principle. It's a hermetic principle. Have you heard of Hermes Tresmagoras, Hermes Thrice Great? No. He's like this ancient Egyptian philosopher. Okay. Lived long ago. And one of the principles he teaches is like whenever something good happens, don't be like on the pendulum and swing so high, like with happiness. Mm-hmm. And the same thing when something horrible happens. Don't be distraught because things change. The yeah. best place for you to be at is kind of like in this middle mm-hmm. ground. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I I try to adopt that as best as I can. And it, it takes practice. It's mm-hmm. it's it's hard at times, especially when really bad stuff happens. And yeah. um, it's easier for me now though to not get so excited when good stuff happens though. I don't know why. Like, I'm like, okay, good. I think because I know how quickly those things can change, especially in acting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, awesome. You got the pilot audition. Great. You got the callback. Awesome. You got cast. But let's film it first and see if you, you stay in the show. Yeah. Awesome. Let's see if we can make it through season one. Great. We made it through season two. All right. Let's make sure we make it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, there's so many, like, yeah. things that could go wrong. So, I don't know, man. I think that's just life, you know? Yeah, I think so, too. I think, uh, yeah, I would describe it my personal experience is more of like a just from becoming kind of so jaded that you just reach an equilibrium and you're just like okay cool <laughs> you know you, you yeah you you just really appreciate everything is where it, is where it landed for me is um cuz it was an upward um trajectory like i said where you know it kind of just it, everything was falling into place and it's great and yeah. but you know with that and because i was young you know, you don't really learn uh, humility and stuff when you're when that's what you're experiencing. And uh, it's kind of funny because you see it in like athletes and stuff. A lot of the guys that are like so cocky or so arrogant and everything. If you look at a lot of times when you look at their life since high school, they have been superstars and it has never stopped. And right. that's why. You know, and they're, you know, on the older side of things, they'll be like late 20s, 28, 29. And uh just still are top of the world. Um, and so, yeah, having, you know, not that I was ever that successful, but having that bit of success and then having it yanked away, um, just, yeah. Keeps you humble. Sobered me up. Yeah. It's like, you know, it makes you realize, uh, yeah, keeps you humble. And, um, and so now, yeah, moving forward, it's a lot easier to deal with the letdowns. Um, but it's, it's, I feel like it's kind of a weird feeling when like good stuff happens and you, and I almost miss, like how younger me would have reacted to the thing. I gotta, I gotta say, like I do like the balance that I have in my life a right. lot more. But damn, when like good stuff happens, now I'm just like I'm more like cautiously optimistic about it because I'm like, yeah, it's good right now. But let's see, you know, like you said, if the paperwork comes through, let's see right. if like, the project goes. Let's see if we get it done and get it edited and then get it distributed or whatever it is. Yeah, I miss just like the hell yeah, like it's happening, like and just like being so. Uh, elated, but uh, well, it's sorry. a real. It's a. Re- it's the reality of what's really going on. Mm-hmm. I remember when I booked my first guest star role, and I heard it on the phone from my agent or whatever. Mm-hmm. I got off and I was like, "Yes, yes, <laughs> yes." <sighs> Where <are> the fireworks? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, okay, cool. I got it. I worked really hard for it. Awesome. And then. I get the paycheck back. You know, I work on set, right, for those few days. I'm like, great. Get the paycheck back. I'm like, oh, they take that much for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I'm only left with a third. <laughs> so I'll have to book about 10 of these a yeah. year. Yeah. And it was that hard to book one. <laughs> so, okay. All right. You see, it's those, like, it's the reality. That we ex- we have these expectations in our mind of what it will be. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's just trial by fire, too, just with life and experience and um, – you yeah. just re- you sober up. You realize the the reality of a lot of things, especially this business is totally bizarre. 
I'm talking with some of my other friends, especially when I went back to home to Oklahoma here recently. Very few things are like our business. Yeah, yeah. It's weird. Yeah, it's very perverse in a lot of ways. It is, but what's attra- like? What attracts you to being a storyteller? Um, kind of the reason that I know that like I love directing and that's kind of my thing is uh, because I've experienced a lot of the different hats that you can wear and everything, and I just love the end, the feeling when like it's fi- when it's finally done, when everything is finally there and like has been perfected behind the scenes you know, in like through editing and sound design and scoring and color correction, and visual effects and all that stuff. And then like finally having it and then like showing that to someone and, or whatever, just watching it for myself. Like that feeling of accomplishment is kind of like the peak for me. Um, I'm not so much, which is ironic, like coming up in like music and stuff. Like I'm not like performing is not like my passion mm. with music. I always loved being in the studio, writing songs and producing everything. And for the longest time, I, I really kind of loathed having to play live, which is, I'm really? sure it can sound kind of strange because that's, you know, especially, yeah, just usually musicians are like born for the stage and like want, everyone wants the spotlight and like, look at me, look at me. That was, that just was never my thing. And I had a tough time coming out of my shell because um, I'm just more of an introverted, like I like, you know, just hanging out in the bedroom doing doing art stuff or whatever by myself type thing and to, you know, having to go on stage. Um, I definitely threw myself into the fire. That's kind of how I, you know, like to tackle things that I'm intimidated by or scared of. It's just like, you gotta just, you know, just, uh, just go in there and just do it. Um, it's great. And I learned to love, I learned to love it. It's a lot of fun being up there, but, uh, never really, it was never really my thing. Um, and so, yeah, with uh, even with film stuff, I just I love perfecting everything like behind the scenes and then and then releasing it. Um, I did my first feature last year. Uh, it's this little indie crime drama yeah. called uh, Backfire, and that was another quick quick paced movie. Like I remember the my the guy that I produced it with approached me. We met up at the end of December, December like twenty eighth or twenty ninth. I, I like. I was looking on Instagram like back two years ago when we first met. That was when he first approached me with the project. We were filming it at the end of February. We shot it in eight days. We got our entire feature done. Like our short we shot in four, four and a half. And that's like, it's like shot a 15 a feature minute thing. Yeah, I shot a 90 days. minute movie in eight days. Yeah. <laughs> it's were, like, at, were your days like 20 hours long? <clears throat> no, they were, I, they were like 12 to 15 type thing. Um, Jeez, we were just uh, we were hustling. I was hustling. Um, Hold on, because it takes our show. We shoot about fifty minutes. Let's say average fifty minutes in eight days. Mm-hmm. Jesus, man, yeah. well, what's <laughs> going on there? <laughs> yeah. It was just. It was one location. It it's was, one shot, right? Uh, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish. Oh my god. No, we just uh, hustled to get it done, and you know, it was all. It was like. There was very few tracking setups, and you know the lighting wasn't super elaborate or anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just just hustled, got it done. Uh, the budget was like eight thousand bucks that we got it done for. Um, by the time post was done, it was twelve, and um, and and then I uh, well, the point of me telling this story was, I, I like had a premiere for it. Yeah. And so I rented out a theater in Philly because th- we shot it in Philly. The whole cast and crew is Philly guys, and. Um, and all my family's there and everything. And it, we sold it out. It's like 300 seater auditorium or whatever. And just to see, because when you're filming, you're looking at a little monitor that's like six inches big. And then when I'm editing, you know, it's a monitor about the size of that or whatever. And yeah. so to see like this project that I've worked on looking at it this big, you know, eight inch maximum kind of screen to then see it in an actual theater and yeah. to like hear everything the way I always like wanted it to be heard type thing. And then to have a whole audience there is, is like hands down the coolest feeling ever. Um, and so it's like, it's those moments that push me through, you know, hour 25 of editing some crap that's not working. That's like the most frustrating thing ever. All, all those things that when you're on set about to pull your hair out and you know, everything's a disaster and you're trying to figure out how to, how to somehow come up with a solution to make it work. 
that's something I appreciated working with uh, you and Britt whenever there was a problem. You guys had A, composure, and B, a solution to it. Yeah. And there was no freakouts. Yeah. That is something where I'm like, okay, that's what I look for in a director and a leader. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, adapting to certain things that, oh, shit, like, oh, we didn't even – we didn't even think about this. Okay, how do we get around this? Or yeah. like we're on a time constraint. What do we need first? Let's get what we need. And then, you know, stuff like that, I really, really appreciate. And I don't think a lot of people learn that. I don't know where you would learn that. Uh, Extreme Ownership, that's where you could learn it by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin, who I've mentioned this book probably every single episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying to get Jocko on the show uh, soon. Nice. I hope we get him on. <laughs> it's going to be an epic podcast. Anyway, yeah. that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Um, that's, uh, not a lot of people learn how to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. I I think it just comes, it comes from, from grinding it out. Uh, I just think it comes from, you know, experience of just doing it for a long time with, with not really like a lot of directors in Hollywood are kind of, kind of like trip and fall into it. Like there's a lot of. Nepotism is rampant in this industry. Let's just really? say that. Really? No, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, there's not really a lot of people who kind of earn their stripes to get to where they're at. And that that's where I think a lot of the, you know, like spazzing out on set because like, oh, this isn't how I like planned it to be. And like blaming everyone because, you know, because it's not or whatever versus just and f- having always been like the producer on my projects too is like you gotta get this stuff done you gotta get make your days you gotta keep it moving and everything because everything time is money and so it's like oh yeah i would love to do this super artistic shot of you know blah blah blah. but if it's going to take four hours to rig something up to do it we're not doing the shot and so just you know you gotta pick and choose your battles and yeah and like i said that you know the i'm glad i don't have that like kind of perfectionist complex because I, f- I would I feel like that would just cripple you in in those type of moments where if it's not exactly how you wanted it I don't know why I keep coming back to that but well then how do you know of, when it's ready uh kind of when it just feels you just I guess you kind of I kind of feel it yeah you just feel like it's ready and it's like yeah and it's just it's cool as long as like as long as there's things nothing that's bothering you anymore about it and you have those you have to like remember the the like so like in editing you you watch the dang thing i've been staring at your face for you know three weeks all day every You're day yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like you know the certain takes and stuff when you first cut them together that's when you feel like you feel it and you're like oh yeah that's that's the way it's supposed to go and that's, okay that's that's what it is but then you, i have to you know uh keep looking at it through, you know, to watching full cuts and certain, you know, beats and all this stuff and frame shaving and then, you know, audio design and all this stuff. And then I've watched it 8 million times that I'm kind of um, desensitized to the to the moment. And so you have to remember how you felt like when you first, when I first cut it together and mm. everything because that's how someone will feel when they first watch it. And gotcha. so as long as you kind of keep that in mind um, by the end and then also, you know, making sure you get some feedback from people you trust is always nice to make sure that like things are working and stuff. But at the end of the day, you got to just pull the trigger at some point in time and nothing, nothing's going to be perfect. And it's all, it's all just fun to, you know, to try and to experience it and then to try to do better on the next one. You know, Michael, can you look up, there's a writer who was on the Joe Rogan podcast and he talks about, I don't know if he's a writer, but he wrote a book about flow state this guy talks about something that I was doing with my work mm-hmm. in terms of like memorizing lines, for instance. There would be this uh, resting, what's it called? Flow. It's just called flow, right? The yeah. psychology of optimal experience. Yes. So he's basically bro- broken down this type of process. For instance, let's say I have a bunch of lines to memorize, okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, cool. I've got like three days. Nah, that that's totally doable for me. So immediately when I get the script, I'm going to be reading it like maybe, I don't know, as many times as I can and start with the first couple scenes, start going over them. And there's a certain point where I reach where my brain becomes almost mush. Like I don't even mm-hmm. – like I'm just like, okay, I, I'm going to trust it's in there. Yeah. And then I'm going to w- 
start up again tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow morning, all of a sudden, the stuff I couldn't do last night, oh, dude, I'm, I've got like 90% of it memorized already. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like a sculpture. He's like chiseling away mm -hmm. on a sculpture and you've got all this excess rock and dust. You have to wipe all that away. So that rest period is the wiping away of the dust and the excess and to see what you've got right there. Yeah. yeah. So this guy, he's actually broken it down into a process to how to get into that flow state where mm -hmm. it's your optimal like working flow like sometimes you're just typing away and you're like holy shit i just wrote like six pages and i couldn't write like one page is the day yeah. you know, a page the day before and he talks about it like sometimes he takes like a four like a 30 minute walk mm -hmm. in between projects and mm -hmm. then he'll get right back into the flow state something about the physical exercise i don't know man you should definitely check it out yeah yeah i will that that sounds very familiar to my own process yeah 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 i know how i work for sure i'm I'm definitely, you know, better in the mornings and and stuff like that. And yeah, when I get fatigued, I I recognize it and mm. I just am, you know, we'll finish it up tomorrow or whatever. Because there's no, it's just, it's such a waste of time, yeah, for me to try to push through fatigue. Um, versus I have like a buddy, uh, my buddy Josh, who like is that's like his style is like just. <laughs> I don't know how he does it, man. He just like drones through stuff mm -hmm. and, and gets it done. Um, just, yeah, just, I guess different ways to skin a cat, as they say. Well, yeah, I think for me that the personal, like when I'm working on my own, I'm not on anybody's time. I need to have those breaks, right? There's certain, a lot of times like what you're saying, mm -hmm. but like, let's say on set, I could be tired off camera or you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But I would love to work. Well, who's that director who takes like 40 takes each like Fincher? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, I would love to do that. I could do that. Yeah. And I would not have, I would want to be one of those actors like, great, let's do it again. <laughs> let's do it again yeah. and again and again and again. My buddy, Isaiah Adams, who is actually coming in right after this, cool. we do our Sunday morning acting class and we've been doing it for like at least a couple of years, almost three years now. Mm -hmm. We will give each other cold reading scenes and we'll just read them over and over and over and over again. And then we'll like adjust a little bit here, adjust a little bit there, do it mm -hmm. a totally different way. And we found so much benefit in doing that. Yeah. We've actually noticed we've booked more since we started the class. That's awesome. And we found more comfortability in like callbacks and stuff like that. I don't know, man. I like that, that repetitious thing, re yeah. repetition thing. Repetitious? That's not a word. I don't think that's a word. Not sure. In this <laughs> show, it's a word. In yeah. this show, in this room, I don't know. I'm an immigrant <laughs> technically, so I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it actually oh. it actually is a word repetitious boom another term for repetitive thank you michael what would we do without michael fact checking man <laughs> appreciate you <laughs> um y are you still making music then while you're while you're creating stories shooting films yeah um yeah i'm kind of in a weird place with music right now but uh i'm pretty i, I know i'll come back to it I've, I've put out a lot of stuff. Like I said, I don't really like, I like to get stuff done. And mm -hmm. so um, I've put out 11 studio albums and two live albums. Jesus, so, 11? Yeah, yeah. Since uh, 2006 was my first one. And so I've put out like an album a year. Um, I haven't done shit this year. I need to get on it. Um, but yeah, it's that's kind of what I've been doing in between film projects and stuff. Dave, I fucking love that, dude. <laughs> You're on it. Yeah. I, I love hearing stories like because then, when I hear somebody else say, "Well, I don't have the time," like bullshit. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for you sure. make the time. Yeah, you just gotta get that. I mean, hard work is like doing it when you don't want to do it. That's like w the, uh, the obvious definition of it. But every, you know, how, like everyone's like just like I don't know on Instagram, whatever. And they're like, yeah, working hard, like grinding out, like hard work pays off, all that stuff. And, you know, and just people just talk about it a lot more than they actually do it. And regardless of that, I just, I like doing it. It keeps, you know, it keeps my mind busy and, uh, and I need that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'll be, I'll be working on some music in the next couple of weeks. I got some downtime because film, so much of the film process is like a hurry up and wait type thing. Um, like I got all everything, whenever I can do something, I get it done like as fast as I can right now. Right. Not you know, sacrificing quality. I just like to just do the work mm -hmm. when it's available. Um, 
And so now that editing is done, I got a little bit of sound design I can do, but I'm waiting on like the visual effects and stuff cool. and the score and everything. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's going to take a couple weeks and, you know, I'll be like reading scripts, looking for the next project. But in, in between that, probably just do some recording and everything. I've got enough music for like another two albums right now. I just got to finish them up. So it's like, yeah, I'll do, I'll keep doing music. Yeah. <laughs> You said something before that I was going to hit on. Oh, um, it, like when people don't feel like doing it, that's when you should – that's that's part of the thing. Yeah, you should do like it. It's not, you're not always going to be in the mood to do it. It's kind of like meditation. Mm-hmm. You're not – meditation isn't just for when things are going great mm-hmm. the, in your life. It's for specifically when things are going shit. That's yeah. when meditation is supposed to benefit you the most. Yeah. So I definitely can resonate with that. Yeah, my buddy said it. Um, DJ Damage, who's a Philly guy – we were talking about rappers because we've been working with rappers our, our whole lives. And uh, I forget what context it was, but he was the one who said it. He was like, man, yeah, that's like a lot of these rappers, like, you know, going out to the club or whatever, getting club appearances or like radio things and stuff like that. Like, that's not the hard work. That's the fun part of doing it. Like, mm-hmm. the hard work is, you know, is hustling to get shows booked or figure out the business side of things and right. getting beats getting in the studio paying for studio time making yes. sure that you get everything mixed and mastered so that you can release everything and then you know and then hopefully reap the benefits from it but yeah a lot of them are, are too caught up on uh showing out on instagram versus actually you know getting projects out and, and making the best music they can and, and stuff like that so dude it's so sad that uh what I I don't know what the guy did in his personal life, but like it's a le- there's a lesson to be learned. Like, be careful what you flaunt on social media. Mm-hmm. Was that X X tension? Yeah, triple. Yeah, yeah. X X tension. He was talking about how he's at a motorcycle place about to. And he was showing off how much money he had, and he was buying something. Three guys showed up, robbed him, shot him. He's dead. Yeah, and it's all over. Like yeah. the, what we were talking about earlier. Like gone yeah yep gotta be super careful the things you were saying about hard work have you seen the tupac video where he's like in the studio telling people michael can you find that on youtube would you mind um it's tupac like talking in the studio saying we should be busting out like song after song after song Mm -hmm. and like he's talking about like his work ethic let's see what we got Mm -hmm. is it footage of tupac in the studio 14 14 minutes Oh God! Okay. Yeah, we're not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> we're watching all of it. <laughs> no. Um, oh gosh, we're. Yeah, he's like at he's like at some point like saying he should be. <sighs> he's basically yelling at the guys in the studio. Like I don't know like what you get, like what you think we're supposed to be doing here, but like yeah. Lil he, Wayne talks about that a lot too because he just he loves being in the studio and he prides himself on his ability to rap and to make dope songs and everything. And he's, he, there's a lot of interviews and a lot of things uh, where he talks about that. And he's like, like, you know, a lot of, all the other rappers love being out and like being, you know, at whatever, doing live shows or being at the club and all this stuff and like getting VIP bottle service and all that stuff. He's like, that's not why I'm rapping. I'm rapping because I like, I love to rap and like, mm. I want to be, you know, the way that like a ball player is in the gym training and stuff. Like I like to be in the studio. That's like, that's what I was, that's what I'm good at. That's what I feel like I was born to do and everything. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Lil Wayne's been massively successful for a very long time now. Yeah. I, I share that same sentiment. I, I, I think there's, there's a balance, you know what I mean? Like, there's certain, like, red carpet events, like, you have to attend to as an actor. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I've, I just, I kind of want to just go to, go to the studio. Oh, my God. The, the parent, you know, I just want to go film yeah. and go home. Yeah. I to- I, I know what you're talking about. I totally lost the, um, the, like, or the allure wore off of, like, mm. of all that kind of fancy stuff of, like, any type of red carpet. It is cool to, like, you know, have a premiere or whatever to like show the like hard work that you've put off. But yeah, in the acting world, especially, you can, there are definitely a lot of actors that you know just want to have their picture taken more than they you know want to make great work type thing. Yeah, and it's just yeah, it's just a difference of yeah prioritizing. I miss rehearsal, more. man. Like for the, I used to do a lot of theater, mm-hmm. so I miss that. Like I got rehearsals, got mm-hmm. rehearsal 
like Monday through Saturday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got to rehearse like four or five hours every single day. It's like I miss going to the rehearsal space for that. Mm-hmm. I feel you. I just I love I like working. Like I that's where you know I'm kind of like at my happiest is when I'm working. I've never been good at like vacationing. Um, mm-hmm. I, like after like two or three days, um, I'm good. And then I'm just like thinking about what I could be doing, what I could be making or creating or whatever. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, it can be frustrating sometimes cause it like totally kills my vibe. Sometimes I just, I'm itching to, to get back and do things, but yeah, it's just, I just love, you know, I, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to flip what was like my hobby into a career and yeah, I just love doing it. I love having projects to work on and and uh, things to create. I I I want a vacation when I'm like either finished with a job and I know I'm starting another one. So I got this window. I'm like, great. Mm-hmm. Now I can vacation properly. Otherwise, mm-hmm. I have the same problem. Yeah, yeah. What else other than that do you do? And it's a lot of stuff that probably fills up your time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. Uh, I mean, I hang out with my girlfriend and stuff. God, yeah. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> I, no, no, yeah, I, yeah, no, no. I should have said that more, like, no, 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 more energy. Like it, is, it is. I love her. She's awesome. It's no, a, no. We got a great relationship. That's and, awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, just this whole industry, just I kind of, my kind of, my life kind of revolves around it. So, I mean, I'm, I run a lot and, you know, I'm, I stay mm-hmm. in shape and everything and I, I need to for my own kind of mental health. Um, Same. That that's like incredibly important. Um, so I do that, and then, but yeah, you know, my day usually just revolves around waking up and you know hitting the gym in some aspect, and then figuring out whether I want to read some scripts or do some editing or you yeah. know, record some stuff or uh, work brainstorm some ideas, do some writing, and then I uh, eat dinner and watch a movie type thing, and I, I get <laughs> it's kind of rinse and repeat. When I when I have my downtime, it's usually towards the end of the day, starting around like five or six. I'll, I'll get in YouTube wormholes, man. Oh yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love learning weird shit about mm-hmm. stuff that I I never thought I'd learn about. We had Jonte Lagrasse, a good friend of mine, an actor, an acting coach on the show, mm-hmm. and I was sh- showing him like these ant farm guy who would build these giant ant farm cities. What? And yeah. And yeah, I just I, I I lost an hour yeah. and I was so invested by the end of it I was like I might I might start an ant farm. Yeah. <laughs> I think I might have to start an ant farm, right? Um no, I what, what have I been watching recently? H3H3 is yeah. like a great YouTube channel. I like the guy's humor a lot. Mm-hmm. How he makes fun of like certain ridiculous videos. I know I know the name uh, cuz it's all over Reddit every day just about, but uh I haven't watched any of this stuff. The soaper guy, you know what soap soaping is? No. It was a uh, very popular in the nineties. Oh, was, with the shoes? Yeah, oh, the, yeah, the yeah. grinding thing on the shoe. Yeah, so yeah. I used to have uh, a pair of those shoes. Okay, so I love yeah. cringe things and this guy, the soaper, he's like still living his heyday in the nineties oh, being still a, doing it? a professional soaper. Oh man. It's if you're looking for like one of the most cringiest videos is watch H three H three podcast, Soper. But then they have another video where they bring the guy on, mm-hmm. and he's showing them how to hit on girls and stuff because that's part of his business model now. As mm-hmm. what he does in Vegas, mm-hmm. um, that's so it's such an interesting balance that they have on that show. Yeah. They'll actually bring the guy that they've been not making fun of, but kind of oh yeah, making fun of, commenting on yeah. the ridiculousness of it. Huh. I don't know. <laughs> Spent hours a day on this. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I tell you what though I've been getting back into is, um, and it's kind of half interesting to watch and half acting work. My strange addiction. I haven't even heard of that. TLC show. My strange addiction. Uh, is it a reality show? Yeah. It's like people who have serious weird addictions. Let's see what comes up. Is there a YouTube channel for that? Oh, sure. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Michael, you're like. My favorite at this. What is this one? My name's Teresa. I'm 44 years old. I live in Bedford, Virginia. Pretty day today. And I'm addicted to eating rocks. What? <laughs> she eats rocks. I don't think I would be able to function every day if I didn't eat. Rocks. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? What a nut! How does she have any teeth left? Bleach. And she drinks bleach. 
or bathe? I love bleach a lot. I ain't gonna say I love more than I love myself, but I do love bleach. <laughs> she bathes in bleach. It's my thing. The tub. Years ago, while she was pregnant with her third child. Away. Dude, what? Until I feel and I'm in a serious relationship with my car. <laughs> He's making out with his car. Dude, I'm telling you. Mixture of several minerals, including granite. They say if you practice in real life, you get better in game. I think it's working. Dude, I'm telling you, these are character <laughs> studies, okay? Oh, yeah. I can see the benefit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see. <laughs> um, hoarders, the same thing. How. Crazy. Oh my That's absolutely bonkers. Dude, <laughs> it's so interesting what people get connected to and like have this, like the guy with his car. Yeah. What? Yeah. L I'm not judging him, but it's strange to me. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, yeah. Strange to most, I would he think. He makes love to his car. Yeah. That whole episode, there's a part in it where he he tells his dad that he's in a, a sexual relationship with his car. Yeah. And he has to repeat it to his dad like three or four times because his dad's like, so like w what? <laughs> yeah, that'll be my reaction too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I. What do you do? You think there's like, how do you help somebody like that? Or do you think that you, you even, like, if they're happy and they're not harming anybody, do you think even it's a big deal? Yeah. No. I mean, if you had a kid, if your kid came up to you <laughs> and said, "Dad." I am in a serious relationship with my bicycle. Yeah. Like a sexual relationship with my bicycle. She's my girlfriend. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Do we I guess... know that it's sexual with the car? Oh, yeah. Michael. Okay. He says it's it in okay. the episode. I promise you. Okay. I'm not, ma I'm, I'm not making stuff up here. <laughs> Plus, I don't he was know. kissing I mean, it. I guess it's, you know. Uh, yeah, it is what it is. I'm sure. I would, I'm sure I would recommend some like some healthier. Uh... <laughs> Dave, you're being so nice, man. I guess. Yeah. Isn't it? I I don't know. I would. I think I'd be on your boat. I'd be like, cool. Can we at least go see a doctor just to make sure we're all good yeah, let's here? Try a few other things. Yeah. Because some there is actually like a cool cool documentary, interesting documentary. Mm -hmm. How some people are are. Um, they fall in love with buildings too, like the Eiffel Tower, hmm. or like weird carnival attractions that aren't in service anymore. Dude, the human <laughs> brain is bonkers. That yeah. interests me. Like, what wires crossed, or what wiring is different from you and me that causes somebody to feel attraction to those things? Because it's, n I don't think it's that far off. Again, I'm not a doctor or, an, or a neurologist at all, but I don't think it's that far off from people who have like a foot fetish. You know what I mean? It's hmm. like, or certain type of like, other fetishes that I, I think is just like a, I don't know, like, like eh, just like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like the <laughs> slightest thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a very curious thing. You ever, you ever hear those stories about people who get hit in the head, all of a sudden they can pay, play piano? I have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What? I don't know how that works. That blows my mind. Yeah. I don't know, man. I'm a, <laughs> see, this is why I get stuck in YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah. Then I, I start learning about the brain and I'm like, okay, all right. How, how can we? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can see see how you get sucked in there. I think it's the acting side of me too, because like when I'm figuring out a character, I always try to think of like, okay, core belief. Where's this? Wh where's this character coming from? How do they view the world? What are like some basic core beliefs that cannot change or will change in the storyline, but are pretty sturdy in the beginning? Because that's the way they view everything. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, no, it's it, it, yeah, and you're you're very good at that, and it's really really cool to um, to see and witness and experience after working together on the short and everything. Oh, cool. um, just because I wrote it, and and uh, you know we we took a lot of time to to build the characters and everything and make sure it's all there, but you you totally brought it to like a whole another level, which is just really cool. Um, oh, nice. Because cool. sometimes yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm like yeah, I just like you know wrote these like monologues or they're, you know the, the few kind of more speechy parts uh, i'm like yeah you know i wrote that you know just hanging out in my underwear you know at the computer <laughs> you know just like trying to make this dope story and then like the depth that you brought to it uh is is so is so freaking cool man yeah, that's so interesting perspective dude yeah because i'm reading that when i read it 
mm-hmm. that draft or like the close draft or mm-hmm. I was like immediately I was like cool I know because I've been doing it for a while so I'm like yeah, okay yeah. cool I know what what to do there oh that's a cool bridge okay let me reread this monologue can I make that oh yeah okay I know what things I'll possibly do mm-hmm. already that's when you can tell a good script from a bad script oh yeah I always give this example when I read Nightcrawl or oh shit was the excuse me Nightcrawler with Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah. Um, I auditioned for that a long time ago. Not oh, yeah. for the, his role, but for the um, the sidekick role. Yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't set that script down. Mm-hmm. I read it all in one go, and yeah. I was like, "Oh man, this is good." Yeah. As opposed to reading a script, another script where you're like, "Okay, I, that that doesn't make." Sense. All of a sudden, red flags start coming up, or or questions that don't make sense. Not not good. Not good questions, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I've been I've been script searching pretty much this entire year, um, looking for the next project, to do, looking for a feature project yeah. that I can like truly, truly pitch and try to make something happen with. And yeah, it's uh, God. There are so many bad, bad scripts out there, and there are just so few that that are able to do it and that are able to execute. And you can. It totally makes sense why there are so many bad movies that get made uh because there's just it's so slim pickings to even find um a really really good script and i think people get impatient and they're like yeah whatever it's kind of good enough and yeah and just go ahead and fire it off and uh you got to have some sort of a a standard bar you know to to hit before you pull the trigger i know i'm i usually just pull the trigger but you know i'm trying to actually hit a certain quality before moving forward and yeah it's it's really hard writing writing scripts is, is really really hard and that's where any any good movie it starts with the script i know it's like the most obvious truth in the industry but well, uh, but it really does start there and yeah and man people miss the mark it's harder to um tr- trick audiences in terms of uh it's e- easy to anticipate certain things in movies now at least i do maybe yeah. because i'm in the business so much but like i feel like with my audience i'm, I'm like writing something with my friend isaiah right now mm-hmm. and our one of our rules is like Nothing is going to be predicted. Yeah. If it's predictable by anyone, we've, we, we've, we have to rewrite it. Yeah. I'm not writing something where somebody goes, I know how this is going to end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the coolest thing I think you can do or the best way you can do it is like to have the character be great on the page. And then that's what gives the actor, you know, then they can go and like breathe this extra life into it. Like, and like great act, you know, that's what like great actors are able to do. I know great actors can take like mediocre stuff and then turn it into like something solid, but just the best of the best is when it's, when it's just such a dope character. And then you got somebody who's just incredible that takes that to like, just to this next, next level, other world Mm -hmm. type thing, which is just really, really freaking cool. What are some Um, of your favorite performances then? Uh, I mean, I'm a huge fan of like Philip Seymour Hoffman and, um, uh, Joaquin Phoenix mm. and um, who else do I have bookmarked that where I just like freaking love that Jake Gyllenhaal um, I've, I've become like a huge fan of uh, especially in the last you know half decade like post Prince of Persia yes he's made a lot of really really good decisions and it's, re- it's really really cool he's so expressive in his eyes which you you are as well which is really really cool there's there's so much life and uh, and like like just depth and uh, I don't know, just so much there behind going, the, behind the eyes, which is so free. Keep it's going. so cool. Man. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm gonna listen to this podcast five times. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it. it it's uh, okay. it was really really cool um, working with you, man. You're you're extremely oh, extremely talented, and uh, it's uh, I've been chatting with Britt, and just like every time we watch, you know, we're doing working on the score for like the la- the end of the short and stuff which is where like the really deep emotional right. stuff is and cracks me up because Brit is like in tears after every time <laughs> <very much. laughs> she's, she's like such a sweet eye. every time yeah I look over and she's like what yeah no it's good it's yeah it sounds good maybe we should change <laughs> this part of that part every single time we watch it like four times in a row uh it's 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 so um so awesome and yeah man it's 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 so so good and uh it reminds me you remind me of like you know Joaquin Phoenix type mm-hmm. thing. You, oh, like, wow. Truly, like you like are one of the best that I've ever seen, and it's oh, really man. it's really really cool, man. I'm like, you're making me so embarrassed. Kind no, of. no, like, no. <laughs> people listening, to this, it's like I know why I brought him on. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not just because of the podcast, man. It's like truly. I appreciate that. Um, Thank you so much. You know, for, you know, with working with people, man. It's yeah, it's really really cool, and like 
we talk all the time and it's like every every project going forward we're gonna find some sort of role in, in it for you oh it's like it's just it's dude, too good man it's, you're too I'm, good. I'm telling you at least 90 percent of the work was done for me because of the script and because of you guys directing it and i am a, a firm believer in that um the same with like shakespeare i'm uh, I don't know, that's a pretty big comparison, but it's different, <laughs> different. But like with Shakespeare, literally 95, 98% of the work is just say the, the fucking lines that he wrote yeah. and know how to say them. And if you're in tune with your body and mind and you're present, mm -hmm. something magical happens. It's literally like memorizing is the work. Yeah. And the key to unlock this magical door is making sure you're present um, and in tune with what's going on and aware. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I'm telling you, dude, it, the, you don't know if you're acting on the words or the words are acting on you. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, a trippy moment. Yeah. It's this like balancing act that you're, you're riding along this whole time and you just got to trust it. Yeah. Um, and so with this script, I was like, dude, it's, it's all right there with, with the way you guys directed it. It's all right there. So kudos <laughs> to you guys. Seriously. Cool. cool. Appreciate it. Um, it's going to be a good project. Uh, do you primarily want to do serious stuff or is it, or is it you want to branch out a little bit into comedy? Uh, no, I'm just a drama dude. Yeah. Drama dude. I've done, uh, I did a web series that was like a dark comedy. Uh, it was called Escorts. I saw that on IMDb. Yeah, yeah. So what's that about? Uh, it's about this college kid who runs an amateur escort service okay. to help out his his collegiate brothers in need. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like, a, it's a dark comedy. We shot it here. It was like one of the first projects I did when I, when I got out here. Um, and it did decently well. We, you know, we got into a bunch of festivals. One, we won one of the festivals and uh, I've had like little bits of distribution for it awesome. and everything. Um, Can people check it out somewhere or? Yeah, it's on, it's on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And it's called Escorts? Escorts, And yeah. they Escorts Dave Patton. I'm sure yeah. it'll come up. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was cool. Um, and that's, it's fun. To, I like having comedic moments, mm. in, you know, like comedic relief type thing um, in in projects. But uh, straight up comedy is, I, that's not my wheelhouse yeah. at all. And I, I love watching those films, but I don't want to make them because it's, yeah, I just... I've just never done comedy. I don't find myself to be like a particularly hilarious person or anything. Yeah, yeah. And so I just, and I, you know, I like dark stuff. Um, so that's, that's where I'm headed with it. Dude, you knew who Chuck Palahniuk is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you read Choke? I haven't. Oh. Dave. Yeah, you got to get on it. Dave, I, I wanted to play the main guy. If yeah. this ever became a, a movie, and I realized they already made it a movie, but mm -hmm. who knows. Anyway, uh, the premise of it, it was one of those books I couldn't stop like turning the page. The ending, I was like, I need to reread it. I didn't quite yeah. get the ending, but it's the character himself is a guy who fakes choking in restaurants. <laughs> so people save him and they feel like they have to take care of him. Like he's, um, it's this weird hero psychology thing where you feel like you have to continue to take care of the person you saved. Uh. It's a really like, interesting thing huh. and then he he keeps collecting money from them to take care of his mom who's in hospice uh hospice hospice is that the right yeah, word? Yeah. Like yeah. Hospice. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 that's wild that's wild i know he's he's crazy with you know his books and all that stuff so yeah i'll definitely have to read it oh dude he's and the twists in it you're like oh my god and the yeah. main character works at a one of those like uh theme parks where it's like turn of the century they're pilgrims and so he's like a mashing butter or making butter in the thing have you have you read choke or uh Chuck um, yeah it's a good one um yeah anyway it's, uh, nice. i'm just thinking about that yeah <laughs> um i'll have to check it out are you so 11 albums all on spotify itunes people can check those out yep yep that's great man yeah yeah it's cool uh it's nice to have a um like a you know like a passive income from all that stuff it's cool because like for so long uh you're just fighting this you know up uphill battle of 
of trying to, you know, trying to survive and pay the bills and all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, it's really, really cool to have have a fan base that still gives crap and everything. And, yeah. You know, even in the last year, I haven't been uh, very active, but, I, you know, I still get, I think I get like 20,000 streams, listeners a month or something like that. Oh, wow, and that's stuff. great. And, uh, and so it's cool. It's really, really, it's cool. I'm in a weird place with music. I feel, I can't help but... Uh, gets me a little insecure i can't help but feel like i, I like never made it happen because um, i never got like the I, ideally what like i wanted was to like have a uh, you know record deal or whatever and have stuff have tour support and be able to like really really do it i've toured i've done everything independently and like i've kicked ass at it i gotta i gotta kind of say like i've you know i've toured the united states and canada and everything and uh sell out live shows when i go back to philly and um, you know, I've been able to to uh, pay for all the music videos that I've done, and all the studio time, and pay for musicians and stuff. And and you know, I've played with like an eight piece band where I got a horn section, and I just like so many amazingly talented dudes. Um, and so it, you know, I, I know I have accomplished a lot. It's just uh, it's, it still freaking bothers me. So I'm in this yeah this weird place right now with it, where I'm like, it just. Where do you want to be? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with where I'm at right now. That's the thing. It's weird. I don't, huh. I, don't okay. I don't have any regrets. Like, I don't believe that if I acted kind of wild in my early twenties and like did a lot of, made a lot of bad choices, I know, but I don't regret making those choices because it's how I felt at the moment. And I don't think like you can, I don't think that's fair to your own you know mental health to to uh regret that kind of stuff like it's yeah i i had like an opportunity on the table and i totally you know acted very mature about it and like and mm -hmm. blew up the whole the whole thing and uh nobody's fault but mine and and that sucks but uh you know it it happened that's how i felt at the time i can't i can't be mad at that necessarily and i've learned from my mistakes and everything and so I'm excited moving forward, uh, focusing more on the film industry side of things uh, to have that in my past and have learned those mistakes so that I yeah. don't act like a total idiot and I can compose myself and you know and and make some projects happen. So, but with music, yeah, I just I don't know. I'm just feel I just feel weird about it. So it's been hard to uh, to get in the studio, and I haven't. I've got a lot of music, but I don't have like the lyrics done because I, I write like the music first and then lyrics right. later like um that's that's a whole another thing uh but uh i haven't had much to write about because i'm like i'm happy kind of in life like i'm happy in a and i'm in a great relationship that i'm happy with and that like was the core of a lot of my music was like girls tearing my heart out and like yeah. being like totally caught up in that and now i like have a great relationship and like and i'm i'm happy with where things are moving and stuff and so music has always been an emotional outlet for me and I, I just I don't really have all that weight on me anymore so it's been kind of weird because I like don't know what to write about there's nothing really like and because my music I, like what fuels me is kind of like the more darker energy and like I'm, I'm not really writing Jimmy Buffett songs like hanging out on you know in the summer of like life is good and everything so I've been having a tough time figuring out what the heck I want to say that's when it fair. Comes to music, so that's fair. Yeah, so um, I don't know. Do you think? Well, so I was talking to my brother William about this. It's like sometimes in order to get to that next level artistically or your next phase, it takes a little bit of just life. Yeah. Experience or not experience, but like just life has to happen, and sometimes that takes a few months. Sometimes it takes a few years. Yeah. Um. I mean, I look back at who I was like five years ago, nine years ago. Yeah. It's like, I'm not the same person at all. Yeah. That's a I don't time. know where I'm going to be in five years. Yeah. Probably yeah. addicted to crack. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I'm freaking pumped. Uh, I just turned 30 this year and like, I couldn't be more excited for this next decade. I feel like I, cause I've got some buddies. I, got, <laughs> I was one buddy in particular back home who who's been dreading turning 30 since uh, since we we're like 26 i swear to god he's he's been like oh man 30's coming up man what if, what am i doing and uh and 
I, I was like, I'm, I'm pretty stoked, man. I feel like I actually know what I'm doing now. Yeah. Like I actually know, yeah, how to get stuff done, how to navigate things, how to conduct myself and take care of business and everything. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really pumped with where things are going to go. And so I think that's part of the reason why with music I, I'm in a weird spot because that was, that was my entire 20s was doing music and touring and playing and putting out albums and doing everything. And, uh, yeah, it feels it feels weird. So I don't know. Do you think a, a trip would help? What kind of tri- what kind so, of trip are you talking about? Oh, so, no, not like a drug. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a Dasa- just Dasani in there, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, like a solo trip. Do you ever do those kind of things? Just go like a vacation. Yeah, like a solo. Just going somewhere. Yeah, alone. Out. No, I haven't really. I haven't done that. Yeah, maybe it's something. To I don't know. That's yeah. Yeah. That itch, you know what I mean? I get that itch whenever I haven't worked in a while. Yeah. And for me, it's like within a few months. If I haven't worked, I'm like, okay, what? I need to find something to do. Go do something. Yeah. Yeah. I can't sit still for a little bit. Yeah. Man, yeah, it's something I might have to explore. Michael, how how often? Because you're a writer. How often do you write? <clears throat> Depends. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll try to get some work done, like at lunch. Sometimes I'll try to do some on the weekends. Um, I will get like a page or two done, but other times it's it's you know pretty sporadic. Like, I can't necessarily do it every day, but like it. There's this one show that I really like called You're the Worst, where the main character is a writer, and he's like, it's all writing. He's playing like a a game on his iPad, and he's he's like, "It's all writing." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you so like, but a majority of the week is done. Like at least some of the days is writing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I try at least a little bit, or I'm thinking about it, or I'm going over something, or. Yeah, that is writing then. Writing is a self discipline game. I think at the core, that's that's what separates like the men from the boys. I think is being able to. Keep yourself like get yourself to actually write. Writing is is, is so difficult. I, the hardest thing I've ever done was uh, writing the book that I had published. Um, I managed to negotiate in advance on the project, and um, and so I had the opportunity to like really hunker down for like you know a solid three four months and do nothing but write. Wow. And uh, and even when you're afforded that time, because that's a lot of like what writers the toughest part is, you know, writing part time is like, yeah. you know, coming back from work and, you know, trying to muster the energy to go write, you know, a bunch of pages or whatever. And even with the luxury of, of not having to, you know, work a day job to get it done, it, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, having to write, the, you know, it's like a 275 page book. Like it's, it's like writing, so you know, a 10 page essay each chapter, you know, whatever, 27 times, and then having them all have to make sense when you read them back to back throughout the thing. Um, and the hardest the hardest part is is sitting down to write, especially when you don't feel like it or you don't want to. Because I tend to write, like, the easiest chapters first, like the ones that are most exciting or whatever. But you got to put in the work, you know, to set everything up and do the boring stuff. And you don't want to because it's boring. It's not as fun. Mm. Um, and you got to just force force yourself through it. Who do you li- who do you like writing wise? Novels. Um novel writers. I'm a I'm a Hemingway fan when it comes to like the more classic type stuff. Um some solid American literature right there. And then I I mean I just reading for fun. I'm reading um Michael Connolly his, his Chris Bosch or no, not Jesus, not Chris, but the <laughs> Bosch series. What's the, what's the guy's name? Uh Rob. Henry Harry Bosch. Harry okay, Bosch. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. it is. Jeez, sorry. Um uh, and uh that's they're fun. They're a lot of fun to read. I've read all like James uh, James Patterson books and stuff. I like the like crime crime novels. The okay. like, David Baldacci and everything. The, they're fun to read. They go they go real fast and they're I real haven't, exciting. I haven't seen Bosch or read any of the Bosch stuff. I freaking watched the show um, on Amazon with. Uh, he's got it up now. I'm trying to see the main actor. Titus Welliver. Yeah. And I'm kind of mad that I that I watched the show before I started reading the books because now I can't get his face out of my head <laughs> when I read it, which like okay. bothers me more than I ever thought it would. 
Uh, but it's all right. Because he starts out as much younger character, like in the series. There's like, the, the, Michael Connelly's written like, I think, you know, 20, at least 20 of these guys' books or something like that with his character. And he starts out like in his like early 40s, I think. And then it progresses. And uh, he's just a little on the older side of things. And it just <laughs> kind of bothers me. But good books. A lot of fun. And they take place in L.A., which is mad fun because and I've I moved downtown uh, at the top of this year and so and I lived in Hollywood and then North Hollywood before that and so I, I know like uh, pretty much everything that he's yeah. talking about which is just makes it so fun to read of like being downtown oh, stopping at like so the, in the jewelry district down on like Seventh and Hill Street which is like three blocks from where I live. Oh, so he's like accurate to where these locations are. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, Harry Bosch is a detective in in Hollywood. And so all the crimes take place in, in Dude, LA. Dude, that that's got to be one of the most intense, freaking jobs in the world, being a detective in a big city. Yeah, I can only imagine the stuff that comes up. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it's anything like the books and TV shows, there's a lot of dead bodies and blood and everything. <laughs> it's not that would not, I could not do that in real life. I'd be way too traumatized, and just way too soft of a person. <laughs> just a normal. Visit to E-Bombs World for me. Yeah, okay. right? Yeah. <laughs> or Live League. No, that's Live League. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Oh, dude, thanks for having me. And uh, once the short film's out and doing the festival circuit, I'm assuming that's where yeah, maybe. Definitely. I don't know. Yeah, we'll okay. definitely do festivals. Yeah, we'll have a little, we'll have to have a little private screening for the cast and crew. That'll be yeah. a lot of fun checking it out. I think it's going to be pretty sweet. And then we're use, you know, we're going to use it to help shop around town, get some more projects going. That'd be great. As well. So, cause festivals take so long. You submit now and they, you know, five months from now, they'll, they'll hit you back with a notification. It's very much a long, long game. I'm, I'm trying to be, um, careful with my words here. I've gone to a few festivals. They will remain nameless. Mm. And when I was expecting some hard hitters, you know what I mean? Some mm -hmm. good quality work. And I was a little surprised with some of the stuff that gets in. Oh yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of totally trash <laughs> movies and shorts and stuff that get into festivals. You gotta watch you know with, I mean? with like which festivals you go to, because uh, especially on the, I mean, the, there's the top tiers and whatever, you know, the Sundance and TIFF and, and Tribeca and all that stuff. But uh, when you're not getting into those, which is like all you know, the projects that I've worked on thus far. Um, because I, you know, there's no A-listers in them, or it seems like those are more politics games to get into those festivals. I digress. Uh, but yeah. the, on the uh, more middle tier and like lower tier things, um, a lot of them are just a, a business that just takes advantage of um, of you know indie filmmakers that are submitting to it. There's a lot of that in the industry across the board in music too. There's like yeah all these sites that you know will like oh like our musical directors uh, from from radio stations and and movies and stuff will listen to your music and give you feedback or whatever for just like 95 bucks a track type thing. You know, you can get feedback. It's the same thing with festivals where, you know, every submission fee is, is like in and around at least 60 bucks to submit your, you know, your short or whatever, um, or feature. And yeah. And they just, they collect all this money from all these submissions and everything. And I've been to some real crappy ones and it really sucks. Like there's a, there was one in New York that I went to that presented itself as this, this, this is going to be this awesome festival with like mad attendees and you know great you know theater and all this stuff and yeah. I go and it was like the upstairs banquet of like some you know shitty little restaurant that they and they had a projector playing with like you know folding chairs and that was the festival and I'm like you gotta be freaking kidding me man are you serious yeah that's like that's what it was and it's like you know they do a great job of hiding it and uh, yeah, it can be a huge letdown. I've been to some cool ones too. Uh, not to totally throw all of them under the bus, but yeah, you gotta you gotta watch because their business model, I swear, is literally just collecting submission fees and you know and turning a profit there. I mean, they all operate, I think, as I don't know. Never mind. I'm not gonna. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, no, I'm uh, kidding. Yeah, no, no, we I, will uh, we'll hit the festivals with this. Some good ones, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. I, I, you know what? I think that's in everything. I'm surprised sometimes at what people are okay with to let the quality go through. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? In terms of like, um, like just your film, you know what I mean? Like simple sound things mm -hmm. or, 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 or like a picture thing or like I saw a boom, mm -hmm. like yeah. a boom in one of the shots. Yeah. I'm like, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. 
Or yeah. what, how did this get in? You know, like what what is the criteria then? I mean, the bar is pretty low when it comes to indie, indie filmmaking. Um, I don't know, man. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. Like my, my one of my friends, he works in construction back home. And he was telling me one of the guys who's like responsible for getting a certain type of concrete. He goes, ooh, I forgot. For like a multi-million dollar project. You just forgot. You just forgot. <laughs> hey, that's your job. Yeah. Hi, bye. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, what are you doing, man? Yeah. A lot of people in life, it seems like that's kind of their style. It's Med- very confusing. Medical stuff? Those horror stories of people like forgetting... Uh, tools in the people. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> well, those freaking doctors, man. Uh, they they must be ramped up on speed or something to be able to get through like twenty hour surgeries and stuff. That's a that's insane, man. It, it oh, when you think about that, it, sometimes it's not the most surprising no. thing that there is like a little no. some screw or something. Or how about floating around in there? Or how about not dancing while somebody's under? And uh, making a video about it. Did you see that? No, I didn't yeah. see that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was. You're watching, you're like, well, they're going to get a bad Yelp review. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, could, could, you not, could you not do that right now? They were like having a good time. While the... <laughs> this is. While I'm song, cut it, play. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing song choice too that's too freaking funny <laughs> how can you imagine being that guy that. underneath and seeing that video michael you're like what what well, well he uh he's he's sued her he's uh or no woman is says that she was unconscious less disfigured so she's probably gonna sue her yeah anyway hilarious all right dave thanks for coming on man if people want to check out your stuff where can they go check that out um, you can hit up uh, Spotify for music stuff. Uh, I got a lot of a lot of my projects are on YouTube, so hit up YouTube. Just type in Dave Patton. Great. And uh, yeah, I got a website, DavePatton.com. It's not. I gotta get it up to date, man. Yeah. Is it just a picture of you saying coming soon? No, nah, it's like the most your... confusing. It's like I always get knocked for the stupid website because because <laughs> I have like everything up there and so yeah. it's like what does this dude do because it's like music it's like albums and there's like all my albums and there's like film and it's like all these like film projects I've done and it's like writing and it's like a book that I've published and everyone's like so what are you like trying to promote yourself as and uh, use Squarespace or uh, no I think it's just WordPress for that oh. guy. Yeah. I need to get something out because you know you're looking for particular space. jobs. It's like I need if I'm just like trying to get jobs directing for like commercials type thing. I need to like just have a website that promotes that, so as not to be confused. And they're like, oh, we're looking at this director, and he's got like he's promoting That's all his true. albums. What is what is going on? Why would we hire this dude? So websites are a total pain in the ass. Squarespace makes it easier for me because I have. It's nice because when I log in, it'll show me my three websites that I have. One for mm-hmm. me, the actor. One for this podcast. And one that I had for my old podcast. Yeah. And you just edit it. And they have the templates are amazing. I recommend Squarespace. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to test it out. It just it wears my patience so thin. I, uh, <laughs> web designing. Man. I hate it. I'm, I'm telling you, Squarespace makes it. it easy. It does. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. This podcast brought to you by Squarespace. I wish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe soon. Hey, we should look into that. Keep talking like that. Uh, actually, I have. <laughs> I know the number that we have to get to get oh, it. Okay. Yeah, we're actually close. All right. Yeah, so it's not too bad. Nice. <laughs> yeah, dude, Dave, you're awesome. Uh, you too, man. Can't wait to see the film, and uh, yeah, we'll fun. have you back on here whenever it's up and running and oh yeah, winning a bunch of awards. Sounds good, man. <laughs> All right, we're out. Later. Oh. All right. What a great episode with Dave Patton. Special thanks to Adobe Radio and everything that you do. Nice guy digital. Uh, Squarespace. (laughs) If you'd like to sponsor us, let us know. (laughs) Thank you, Michael, for everything that you do as well. Thank you to our listeners. As a friendly reminder, you can download the show on iTunes Podcasts. Listen to the rest of it. You can also see it on YouTube. You can see my pretty face on there. (laughs) Guys. Thank you to you for listening. Hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. Let me know that you're listening to the show. I can give you a shout out. Special thanks. If you have any questions, let us know too. Maybe I'll answer some. Maybe we start doing question thing. I don't know. Who knows? All right. We out.